Hi, and welcome to another story, and today we have part six of Lily Alone by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from chapter 11. I scurried down the dark stairwell and made for the dustbin sheds. I hid inside that horrible smelly shed and cried. I'd let myself believe Mum really would be back, and yet she was obviously still in Spain, not giving a toss about us. And Mr Abbott had clearly got suspicious and told tales, and now everyone was after us. We'd got taken into care, we would be, and Mum would be put in prison. Our only hope was to stay hidden in the park until Mum came back at last, and then pretend we were all away with her. Old Kath would poke her nose in and say she'd seen me, but who would believe a mad old lady like her? Yes, that's what I had to do, stay hidden in the park till tomorrow, or next week, or whenever. Meanwhile, I had to find something for the kids to eat. I wondered about scrambling up into the rubbish bins and foraging there, but they all smelled so bad. I was sure any food would be rotten. I couldn't risk poisoning the kids. I wiped my eyes and nose with my t-shirt and then crept out. I scurried away from the estate, sure everyone was looking at me, worried that they all knew about Mum. I went up to the little parade of shops. I wondered if I dared try to nick some chocolate from Mr Patel's, but he didn't let kids into his shop on their own. The smell from the chippy was making my mouth water. I stood outside, breathing in the wonderful warm salty smell. Joe, the chippy man, saw me lurking and waved. Hey there, Lily. Come for five fish suppers. I hesitated. I liked Joe and he'd always seemed to like me, giving me extra chips or adding the odd little bit of batter to my portion. There was no one else in the shop. I stepped in, swallowing, trying to get up the nerve. What's up with you, Chicky? he said. Maybe I had tear stains on my cheeks, or perhaps I just looked worried sick. Joe, I need four fish suppers, or maybe three. I, I could share with Pixie. Coming right up. Yes, but I haven't got any money, I said. Well, go and ask your mum, darling. I, I can't. He looked at me. I waited for the questions. Maybe he'd laugh at me or get angry for wasting his time, but he started turning fish in the fat and shoveling chips. Pay me when you can, he said simply. Oh, Joe, thank you so much. I started crying again like a fool. Joe served each fish supper up carefully in its cardboard box, sprinkling the chips with salt and adding a slice of lemon to the fish. He put all four boxes in a carrier and handed them over. There you are, love. You're an angel, Joe, I said, and took them quick before he changed his mind. It seemed much further trudging back to the park and the fish supper started to feel surprisingly heavy. I kept swapping hands, the carrier banging uncomfortably against my legs. I still felt horribly conspicuous, sure that people were staring at me, pointing, whispering to each other. Every time I saw someone use a mobile phone, I was worried that they were calling the police. I kept peering round anxiously whenever I heard a car, sure it was them. I got inside the park gates and started running down the sandy path. I knew where I was going. The route was familiar now and I'd marked the tree but it seemed to be taking longer to find than I'd thought. What if I couldn't find my way back? What if the children were stuck in the tree, waiting and waiting until it got dark? I started running again, desperate to get to them. Sure they'd be worried sick by now. Poor Bliss would be beside herself, Pixie in tears, Baxter red in the face, trying not to cry. I was so sure they'd be in a state that it was almost annoying to come across Bliss and Baxter swinging on one of the lowest branches of the tree, waving their legs, while Pixie capered about grunting. They were all laughing their heads off. What are you all doing? I told you to stay in the tree. It got too squashed in the tree, and Pixie had to get out anyway to do a wee, said Baxter. We were playing such a funny game called monkeys. Lily, said Bliss. I, I made it up and the others liked it a lot. I was trying to look after us like you do. Don't be cross. You lot aren't taking this seriously. People could be out looking for us, ready to grab us and take us into care. We've got to hide, I said. But there's no one here, silly, said Baxter. What's that you've got in the carrier bag? Smells good. He tried to grab it. Leave off. I'll give it to you when you're all sitting down nicely. We'll go in the ferns and duck down out of sight if anyone comes. What have you got for us, Lily? It's fish and chips, I said proudly. Enough for all of us. Hooray, hooray, fish and chips. Shh, we've got to be quiet. Come on, in the ferns. They did as they were told now, eyes bright, smacking their lips. I handed out the packets of fish and chips. They were only lukewarm now, of course, but they still tasted wonderful. It was only when we were picking out the last little crumbs of chip and batter that Bliss wriggled closer to me. Did you go home, Lily? She whispered. I nodded. So Mum hasn't come back yet. Pixie looked up and started mouthing. Mum, Mum, Mum. I think she could be coming back tomorrow, I said. So she's not there now. She's a mean old bag, said Baxter. She's bad to go away and leave us. Stop it. You must, uh, mustn't ever tell on her because then they won't let us live with her. They'll give you away to a foster, new foster home. A, mum, a new foster mum and dad. I don't care. I don't need a dad. I've got one. And we've got a mum when she comes back. Tomorrow? Bliss said. Yes, I hope so. 
When she comes back, we'll all go back home and pretend she never went away. And if anyone asks us, police or social workers will swear we were away on holiday with her, okay? But Mr. Abbott came round and saw us. Bliss said, Shut up! I don't want to talk about him, I said fiercely. I couldn't bear to think that it was Mr. Abbott who had told on us. Mr. Abbott, my special friend. He'd made it all so complicated now. Maybe we could never go back. We'd have to live in the park forever. When I went to sleep that night, I imagined us in five years' time, still living here. I'd be 16 then, practically grown up, so I'd be able to build a proper treehouse for us. I could plan it all out in my drawing book, get Baxter to gather wood, and we'd build a house way up in the branches where we'd be safe forever. We wouldn't just eat other people's leftovers. Bliss and I would learn about wild herbs and berries, and gather nuts and cook wonderful stews over a little fire. I thought about meat. There were hundreds of rabbits in the park, not to mention the deer. Baxter might be up for hunting. But I couldn't stand the thought of killing all those beautiful creatures. We could maybe go fishing in the ponds at night, but the rest of the time we'd have to be vegetarian. I could teach Bliss and Baxter and Pixie all their schoolwork. We could maybe get books from one of the posh houses, pretending they were our library and we were just borrowing them. We'd need to nick more clothes though, but we could manage with just one or two outfits each year. Perhaps old clothes people left outside charity shops. Maybe one day someone would leave their old banger in the car park and we'd fix it up. Baxter would be brilliant at that. Then we'd drive all around the park in our car at night. I went to sleep believing we could really live here forever. But when I woke up in the night, I felt small and scared again. I wondered how on earth I was going to manage. I was so cramped up underneath the others in the tree I couldn't move. I disentangled myself as best I could, climbing out and stretching out in the ferns. I had more room now, but it felt so lonely and cold, and I was scared the deer might come along and trample me. I rolled over onto my back and stared up at the moon and stars. Please let us be safe, I wished. Make me able to look after the kids. Perhaps I didn't want to live all alone in my white house when I was grown up. Perhaps I wanted Bliss and Baxter and Pixie living with me too, the four of us forever. I lay awake for ages, the stars spinning above me. I didn't get to sleep until the darkness faded to an eerie silvery grey, and I knew it was nearly dawn. I fell deeply asleep until I was vaguely aware of the kids chatting to each other. I heard several little thuds, so I guessed they were out of the tree. Pixie started wailing, and I tried to open my eyes, but she quietened after a minute or two. When I next stirred, I heard her choking with laughter. They were all laughing, playing happily together. I burrowed deeper into my ferny bed, wishing I could stay there forever. I didn't want to get up and face the day. I'd have to try to find us something to eat, and I was just fast running out of ways to do it. I'd also have to decide whether I dared risk creeping back to the flat to look for Mum all over again. I didn't want to be the eldest any more, looking after everyone. I seemed to be I seemed to do that even when Mum was around. I wanted someone to look after me. The kids were still laughing, but Bliss was squealing, frightened about something. I forced myself to sit up in the ferns and look for the children. I rubbed my eyes. Where on earth were they? They sounded so near, but I couldn't see them at all. Bliss? Baxter? Pixie? I called. Pixie giggled and then pounced on me from behind. You've woke up, Lily. We're playing monkeys again. I can't get up the tree, but Baxter can. And Bliss? Up. I looked up and just about died. Baxter and Bliss were right up at the top of the tree, swinging precariously from a branch. Oh, you idiots, come down. Come down this minute, I called. We're monkeys. We don't come down, do we, Bliss? We go up and up and up, said Baxter making silly grunty monkey noises to punctuate his sentence. You wait till I catch you, and how dare you get Bliss to do it too. Come down, or I'll come up and slap you down, I yelled. Baxter saw I meant business. He hung there for a good thirty seconds, just to show me, and then he started edging his way back along the branch to the trunk of the tree. That's right, good boy. Now you, Bliss, I shouted. I'm up really, really high, Bliss squealed. Yes, you are. Come down now. Bliss clung to the branch, wrapping her arms and legs around it. Come on, Bliss, edge along like Baxter. Gently now, a little bit at a time, I called. Don't look down. Bliss did look down and started crying. I said, don't look down. I'm too high up, Bliss wailed. Yes, I know you are. I wanted to be brave like Baxter. Well, you are, Bliss, but that doesn't mean you go scampering up to the top of trees like a demented squirrel. I tried to sound calm, telling her silly jokes so she'd relax a bit. Come along, you, ne you need to come down now. There's a good girl. I, I can't, said Bliss. Yes, you can. Show her how, Baxter. It's easy peasy, said Baxter, swinging himself onto the branch again. Bliss screamed as he made it sway. Baxter, stop it, gently. I'm just showing her. Look, Bliss, like this. He demonstrated, crawling along the branch towards her. That's it, Baxter. See, Bliss? Copy Baxter. Let go with one hand and move slowly along. I don't know how. I can't let go. I'll fall, said Bliss. Look, Bliss, Baxter bellowed. Bliss couldn't look. She was sobbing helplessly, unable to move. 
Could you jump down and I'll catch you, I said. No, wait, don't, it's too far. You scramble down, Baxter, then I'll come up and help you. Bliss, baby, it's all right, you're quite safe, don't cry. We'll get you down in no time, I gabbled. I'll fall, I know I'll fall, Bliss said. No, you won't, I promise you won't fall. Just hang on a few seconds more and then I'll come and... But as I was saying the words, the branch started creaking. It's moving, help me, Bliss screamed. I clawed my way up the tree, but the whole branch suddenly snapped right off. Bliss clung to it instead of trying to jump free. She landed with a crash on the bumpy earth by the tree roots. Oh my God, Bliss! Bliss, are you all right? I yelled, scrambling back down the tree. Baxter reached her before I did. He knelt down beside her and burst into tears. Shh, Baxter, Bliss! Bliss, talk to me! I said, running over to them. She can't talk. She's dead! Baxter wailed. Dead, dead, dead! echoed Pixie like a little chiming bell. She's not dead! I said, kneeling down beside Bliss. She was lying crookedly, her head thrown back, her arms out, one leg all twisted. Blood trickled down her forehead. Her eyes were closed. She looked dead. Bliss, please wake up. You can't be dead. I won't let you be dead. Bliss, please, please open your eyes. I saw her eyelids flicker, and then very slowly, as if her lids were very heavy, she opened her eyes. Oh, thank you, thank you, I said, putting my arms around her head. I felt her shudder right through her body, and then start crying. It's all right, Bliss. I've got you. We'll make you better. Don't worry, I said. I straightened up and tried to tend her poor body. The cut on her head looked deep and scary. I needed something clean to staunch the wound, but all our clothes were really dirty now. I broke off a big fern and tried to mop at it with that, Bliss wincing underneath me. I dabbed at the scratches on her arms and then looked at her legs. One had a bloody knee, but it didn't seem too bad. It was her left leg that was terrifying. It was bent the wrong way, and when I tried very, very gently to straighten it, Bliss screamed. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, darling. I didn't mean to hurt you, I said. I don't know what to do. Your poor leg. Bliss was grey-white, tears seeping down her face. Baxter sat down beside her, very careful not to jog her in any way, and held her hand. Lily, her leg, he mumbled. Yes, I know. It looks as if it's going to fall off, said Baxter. Bliss gave a little gasp and tried to raise her head. No, you keep still, darling. Don't take any notice of Baxter. You know what he's like, I said, though her leg really was dangling, just like a doll's. Is Bliss dead? Pixie asked. No, of course not. How can she be dead? She's got her eyes open, I said. But she's very, very hurt, Pixie said solemnly. I swallowed. Yes, she's very hurt, but she's going to get better, I said, stroking Bliss's bloody forehead. Don't worry, Bliss. I know it must hurt horribly, but if you just rest for a while, then I'm sure you'll start to feel better soon. My voice tailed off. I couldn't bear to hear the rubbish I was speaking. I couldn't pretend any more. It was obvious to all of us that Bliss had broken her leg, and very badly too. She also had a long seeping cut on her forehead that needed stitching. I... I think... Just to make sure we'd better take you to a hospital, Bliss, I whispered. No, no, I can't go, Bliss said. She's frightened of hospitals, Baxter sniffed. No, well, I am, but I can't go because we have to stay hidden, Bliss gasped. I know, but... You need to go to hospital now, Bliss, I said, shivering. I'll be all right. I'll rest, like you said, Lily. But your leg, it must be hurting terribly. I could hardly bear to look at it. It doesn't hurt too badly, Bliss lied. Bliss, you can't move. Well, I'll keep still. Stop being so brave, Bliss. Baxter shouted. Why did you have to climb up so high? Because you told me to. Yes, but you don't have to do what I say. Look what's happened. You have to get better or it's all my fault, said Baxter, still hanging on to her hands. It's my fault. I should have stopped you all playing stupid monkeys, I said, stroking Bliss's hair. It's my fault. I said let's play, Pixie whispered. It's my fault. I fell, said Bliss. But it's okay. I'm starting to feel a lot better now. She was still grey and her head was still bleeding and her leg was smashed. I knew we didn't have any choice. We had to get her to hospital straight away. I got Pixie's buggy, thinking we could somehow squash Bliss into it and push her out of the park. But when Baxter and I tried to lift her, she screamed again. And then I think she fainted. Her eyes didn't close properly. We could see an eerie slit of white beneath her eyelid. She really does look dead now, Baxter sobbed. We've got to get an ambulance to come for her. They'll know how to lift her properly. We're going to break her more if we haul her about. You two stay here with her. I ran through the ferns, up the slope, towards the road. I stood by the side and started waving my arms frantically. The very first car stopped and a lady wound down her window. What's the matter? You know, I'm not supposed to stop here. This isn't a silly game, is it? No, I swear it's not. It's my little sister. She's broken her leg and she's bleeding. Do you have a mobile? Oh, please, could you call for an ambulance to come and take her to hospital? She phoned straight away. And then she parked her car by the side of the road with her hazard lights flashing. 
She ran down the slope with me, her shoulder bag bumping against her side. Oh my goodness, you poor little thing, she said when she saw Bliss. What happened? She was playing in the tree and she fell, I said. You were playing by yourselves, said the lady. What about your mum? I was so distraught, I couldn't think of a single thing to say. I just shook my head and cried. The lady knelt down beside Bliss. Don't worry, dear, an ambulance is coming and we'll get you to hospital very shortly, she said. Bliss moaned, her eyelids fluttering. Make her stop looking so funny, said Pixie, and started crying. Don't cry, don't cry, I said, over and over, one arm around Pixie, one arm around Baxter. We all stared at Bliss, shaking for what seemed an age, and then at last we heard the ambulance coming. The woman scrambled back towards her car to show the ambulance people the way. What's going to happen to us, Lily? Baxter asked. I don't know, but we have to save Bliss, don't we? They won't take her away, said Baxter. I won't let them. We're all going to stick together, the four of us, I said. Then the ambulance people came running, a man and a woman, and they knelt beside Bliss and asked her questions, but she still couldn't open her eyes properly, so I answered for her. Then they lifted Bliss very, very carefully onto a stretcher. I gathered up Headless and my crayons and sketchbook and angel cards and Baxter's forklift truck and Pixie's handbag and our fairy tale book. I left the blankets and pillows and Pixie's buggy because there wasn't time to collect them and they didn't seem important now. We can come too with our sister, I said, running after the ambulance lady. Of course you can. You all look a bit groggy. We need to check all of you, she said. Have you been camping in the park? Well, sort of. And what about mum or dad? I took a deep breath. We ran away, I said. Why was that, love? We just wanted an adventure, like in storybooks, I said. Oh dear, well, you've had an adventure all right, especially this poor little mite, said the ambulance lady, shaking her head at Bliss. Is she going to be all right? I tugged her arm and whispered, she's not going to die, is she? I'm sure she'll be right as rain in no time, though she'll be hobbling around with that leg in plaster for a while. She'll have one of those big heavy plasters, said Baxter. I've always wanted one of them. Wait for me, Pixie called. I'm coming in the ambulance. The lady from the car had picked her up and carried her, but now she was struggling. I'll take her now, I said, grabbing Pixie. Thank you very, very, very much for helping us. The ambulance man took her name and address. They wanted our names and address too, when we were all strapped into the ambulance and on our way to hospital. I'm Mikey, and this is Bluebell, and those two are Rose and Bunny, said Baxter, thinking fast. And we live at number 12 South Block, said Pixie, gabbling our full address, proud that she could remember it. She's just making that up, I said quickly. Shut up, Bunny. I think you're making things up too, sweetheart. And I understand why, said the ambulance lady. But this isn't a game, kids. We need to know who you really are, especially your sister here. We'll need to check her hospital records, see? She's Bliss, I said. And that's Baxter and Pixie. And I'm Lily. The ambulance lady frowned at me as if she thought I was still making it up. There are real names, honest. Mum wanted them to be unusual. And what about Mum? What's her name? Kate Green. And does she know you were in the park? No, no, we ran away, I said. It's all my fault. It'll be all my fault if Bliss doesn't get better. Now, now, I told you, I'm sure she's going to be fine, said the ambulance lady. Come here. She stayed by Bliss's side, but she held her arm out. I edged nearer and she put her arm around me as if I was one of the little ones. I let myself cry a bit then, but I had to choke all the tears away and be strong when we got to the hospital. They carried Bliss out on her stretcher and we followed, Baxter and Pixie clinging to me tightly. I thought we'd have a long wait in A&E. I'd sat there several times when Baxter had head-butted the door or, or stuck an acorn up his nose or cut his fingers playing with Mikey's knife. But we were taken straight through the waiting room to a little cubicle. They laid Bliss down on the bed. Her head jerked and her eyes opened properly. Lily? It's all right, Bliss. They're going to make you better, I said. We went for a ride in a real ambulance. It was a shame you were asleep, said Baxter. It really went, Nina, 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 said Pixie. Bliss put her hand up and felt her head. Her hand came back all bloody and she started crying. Hey, hey, don't poke around in that cut, sweetheart, said a nurse. There's a hole in my head, Bliss whispered. It's just a nasty cut. We'll stitch it up for you. Will it hurt? Just a little bit. I've had stitches, said Baxter. I yelled. Will you stitch her leg up too, Pixie said. No, we'll put Bliss to sleep and then we'll stretch it out and put plaster on. Oh, I've never had a plaster, said Baxter. I don't want a plaster, said Bliss. You can choose the colour, darling. You tell me and I'll tell the doctors. Would you like a lovely bright pink plaster or maybe purple or blue? She'd like blue, wouldn't you, Bliss? I said. Yes, blue, Bliss mumbled, closing her eyes again. She reached out her hand. Will you stay with me, Lily? Of course, I said. I found Headless and tucked him in beside her. Look, here's Headless. He'll stay with you. Oh dear, he's been in the wars too, said the nurse, chuckling. You stay with us too, Lily. 
I don't like hospitals, said Baxter, leaning on me. Stay with me, said Pixie, clutching me. I'm staying with all of you, I said, though I didn't know how I was going to manage it. I knew they wouldn't let me go into the operating theatre with Bliss, especially not with the other kids tagging along too. The nurse examined each of us and said we seemed fine. No, I've got a bad leg, said Pixie, sticking it out. Can I have a pink plaster? You need a lovely hot bath and then you can have a pink leg, said the nurse. Now, let's get your sister mopped up first, eh? She dabbed at Bliss's bloody head very gently. Are you stitching, said Bliss, and she started screaming. Hey, hey, what are you doing to my kid, said someone, rushing through the curtains. It was mum. Oh, glory, it was our mum back at last, and now everything was going to be all right. Chapter 12. It was so wonderful to see her, brown all over, her hair really blonde, looking lovely in a new bright pink t-shirt and white jeans. Mum, we all shouted. She hugged Pixie and Baxter and me, and then put her head down beside Bliss. My poor baby, she said, cradling her. Don't you worry, Mum's here. How did you know where we were, Mum? I whispered. The police came knocking at my door. I was panicking anyway, wondering where you kids had got to. And then they said you'd all been taken off to hospital. My God, the shock. What were you playing at, eh? Don't be cross, Mum, said Baxter. I'm not cross, baby. I, I just want you all safe and sound back home, especially my poor little Bliss. I felt so weak with relief. I had to lean against the wall. Mum was back and now no one need know. She'd ever gone away. Bliss would get better and we'd all go back to normal. Mum and us kids at home. I could tell it like that. I'm good at making things up. I could pretend it until it seemed as if it really happened that way. I don't want to rewrite the truth. There were two policemen poking their heads into our crammed full cubicle. There was an older one with a red face and grey curly hair and a younger one with fair hair and kind brown eyes. Come on, Kate. You've seen your kids. You need to come with us now, said the older ones. Are you completely bleeding heartless? I can't leave them now. Look at my little bliss, please. I'm begging you. Let me stay with her a while while she gets her head and legs sorted. You don't have to stay here. I swear I'm not going to do a runner, please. This is killing me, Mum said, tears pouring down her cheeks. You can turn on the waterworks for all you're worth, Kate, but uh, I've been in this job too long to be affected, said the older one. Haven't you got kids? I need to stay here for their sake. Oh, please, please. I'll stay with her said the younger one, looking at his watch. I'm off duty at two anyway. I'll bring her in myself. No worries. Oh, you're an angel, said mum. No, you're a sentimental fool. Okay, you deal with her and sort out all the social worker stuff. I'm off for my grub. So the young policeman waited while they took Bliss away to fix her leg. He took a chair and sat just outside the curtain to give us a bit of privacy. Mum sat on the bed with Pixie and Baxter on her lap. I squashed up beside them, rubbing my head against Mum's soft shiny hair and brown neck, breathing in her warm powdery smell. My babies, Mum said, holding us close. She gave us all butterfly kisses, stroking our hair. I love you so. You know that, don't you? We love you too, Mum, I whispered. I'm so sorry I didn't look after Bliss better. You did just fine, lovey. You were a bit mental going off to that park like that, but it, it doesn't matter, Mum said wearily. I can't believe you're really here, Mum. I said I'd be back at the weekend, silly. I got the first flight back this morning. Did Gordon come too? No, he's staying over there. It's where his job is. I told you, and I don't blame him. It's like a little bit of heaven. And the sun. Oh my God, look at the colour of me. I've never been so tanned in my life. Do you still love him, Mum? Well, yes, of course I do. I'm crazy about him. Those first few days, well, it was just fantastic. But then he found a photo of you kids. I had it in the back of my purse and he asked who you were. And so I thought, blow it, let's tell him. He might be thrilled to have a really ready-made family and your lovely looking kids, especially Pixie. But it freaked him out. And then he went all holier than thou. He pretended he didn't mind the fact that I had kids and was a bit older than he thought. He said he couldn't stand it and I'd lied to him. Honestly, he really got on my nerves then, so I said stuff too. I walked out last night, actually, stormed off. You know what I'm like. But then I felt a right idiot because I didn't have enough cash for the flight home. Mum lowered her voice, nodding towards the policeman's legs, showing beneath the curtain. There's been a bit of a problem with my credit card. I think they've blocked it now, she mouthed. Anyway, Gordon came looking for me and acted like Lord Muck, doling me out some dosh, making me feel like dirt. Still, he did come out with me to the airport, and he said he'd keep in touch, but I think he was the one lying then. I'm sorry, Mum. Oh, well, I'm just not lucky in love, am I? Especially not with that piece of rubbish, Mikey. Did he just walk out on you kids? Where is he? He's in Scotland on a job, Mum. He never came. What? Well, we'll tell that to the policeman lurking there. 
They want to pin all sorts of rubbish on me. Child neglect, abandonment, whatever. I kept telling them till I was blue in the face that I'd never walk out on you kids. If I was that sort of mother, would I be frantic about my poor little Bliss? She's been gone ages. What do you think they're doing to her? Bliss came back at last, lying very still with her eyes closed, headless tucked under her chin. Her leg was plastered bright blue, just as they'd promised. Bliss, said Mum. Oh, Bliss, baby, are you all right? Open your eyes and talk to Mummy. Come on. She'll be very groggy for a few hours yet, said the nurse. I haven't got a few hours, said Mum. I'm going to be whipped off down the nick. Come on, Bliss, wakey, wakey. I need to know you're okay. She tickled Bliss's tiny neck. Bliss twitched and mumbled. I'm okay, Mum, without even opening her eyes. There. Well, you be a good girl while you're in hospital, darling. And Baxter and Pixie, you be good too. Do what Lily tells you. You're in charge, darling, Mum said to me. But, Mum, don't worry, babe. I'll get it all sorted out soon. I swear I, I will. Just look after the kids and make sure you all stick together, said Mum. Oh, Mum, don't, don't go, I said. I don't want to go, said Mum, hugging me. The policeman put his head through the curtain. I'm afraid I've got to take your mum away to answer a few questions. But don't worry, someone's coming to look after you. Come on, Kate. I've kept my word. You've seen the little ones safe and sound, all neatly stitched and plastered. We have to leave the moment the social worker finally arrives. No, not yet. Look, give me a break. You've got it all wrong. It's their dad you want to be nicking, not me. Isn't that right, Lily? Mum said desperately, clinging to Baxter and Pixie. Yes, it's all his fault. He wouldn't look after us, I gabbled. Listen, you can't take our mum away. She's the best mum in the world. She didn't leave us. I swear she didn't. He nodded at me and said he understood how I felt, and he gave Baxter and Pixie some chocolate to stop crying. But he wouldn't seem to take me seriously. Then, a social worker came, breathless and in a rush, smelling all sweaty. She tried to prise Baxter and Pixie away from Mum. They started screaming, and Mum did too. No, don't! Mum didn't mean to leave us. Why, why won't you listen to me? She thought we were with Mikey. You can't take her away now. We need her. Bliss needs her. I shouted over and over, but it was useless. Mum got dragged out of the hospital and we were left on our own. It's mad. They're arresting Mum for leaving us and yet they're forcing her to leave us now. Come on, Lily, calm down. You're frightening the others, said the social worker. She had a funny accent and moles on her face, like little mushrooms, and I hated her. It isn't just because your mum went off to Spain. They're making inquiries about credit card fraud. It was like a slap in the face, but she still couldn't shut me up. They can't pin something like that on my mum. It's all her friend's fault. She gave it to her. My mum hasn't done anything. The police are just making inquiries. You know how it works. They'll get everything sorted out with your mum. And meanwhile, I'm going to take you three off and give you something to eat. And then see about finding you somewhere to stay tonight. If mum's not back. We're staying here. We can't leave Bliss. You can't all camp at the hospital. There isn't room. The nurses will look after your little sister. I can't leave her. She gets so frightened. She needs me. She needs all of us, I said. We've got to stick together. Mum said, I'm afraid you've got to do what I say now. Kiss your sister goodbye and come along. I'll let Baxter say goodbye to Bliss first. You tell those nurses I'll come and bash them up if they hurt you, my Bliss, he whispered, patting the top of her head. I love you. I lifted Pixie up onto the bed. Love you, Bliss, she said, and gave her a big kiss on the cheek. And I love you too, my bluebell Bliss. Bliss, don't you worry. I'll make sure we're together as soon as you come out of hospital. You're such a brave girl, braver than all of us put together. We'll see you very soon. Bliss reached out her hand and I twined my fingers in hers, but then I had to let her go. We were led away, Baxter, Pixie, Pixie and me. The social worker took us to the hospital canteen and said we could choose anything we liked to eat. We were still so stunned she had to choose for us, fish and chips and peas. We couldn't eat properly, not even Baxter. We just chewed a few chips. Eat up, possums, said the social worker, brightly sipping her own coffee. She got out her mobile phone and went and sat at a table by herself to make her calls. Possum, said Baxter. She's stupid. Is she our mum now, said Pixie. No, of course not. We've got our mum, silly, I said fiercely. I want her back, said Baxter. I know, we'll get her back. You'll see. That lady's not looking. Shall we try to do a runner, said Baxter. Yeah, but I don't know where we could run to. Shh, Baxter, I want to hear what she's saying. I couldn't hear much. Three kids, a fourth in hospital, emergency foster care. Perhaps we'll have to split them up. I stood up and went over to her. I grabbed her wrist. You can't split us up, I said. We have to stay together. Put us anywhere, but we have to be the three of us four when Bliss is better. I'm doing my best, Lily, she said. Can't we just go home? I can look after the kids. I've been doing it all week. It's what I always do, please. She looked me straight in the eye. I can't let you, Lily. 
I know you can look after the others, but it's not allowed. I'm sorry. I'm doing my best to find you a suitable place. It might be just for tonight, until we know what's happening about your mum. Don't look at me like that. I'm on your side. She did try, but she couldn't find anywhere that would take all of us. She found a place for Pixie first, a lady who took in babies. She didn't usually take anyone over five, but the social worker persuaded her to take Baxter as well. Couldn't she take me too? I begged. I promise I won't be any trouble, and I'll help look after the kids. They'll need me so. Pixie's only little. She still likes me to carry her, and Baxter can't bear to be without Bliss, and he'll start acting up if he's not handled right. They wouldn't listen. I had to hug the kids and then leave them with this woman in a funny little house the other side of town. The baby lady picked them both up when they started crying, even though Baxter weighed a ton. She looked as if she'd be kind to them, but she was a stranger. How can you think that lady can look after the kids better than me? I wept, back in the car with the social worker. I know you're wonderful looking after the children, Lily, but it's not your job. You're only 11. You're just a child yourself. Now let's try and get you sorted. No one seemed to want me. She phoned three different families and they all made excuses. I ended up in a children's home. It's only temporary, Lily, just until we know what's happening with your mum, the social worker repeated. Don't look at me like that. I know this is very hard, but I'm trying to do my best for you. So this was her best shot, a lousy children's home, very run down and teeming with strange kids, all yelling and swearing and fighting. It's a bit of a madhouse here, said Stevie, smiling at me. She was in charge, a big woman in a silly animal sweatshirt with a very bad haircut. There were eight or nine boys, all with bristly hair and wearing football strip. I couldn't tell them apart, even if I wanted to. There was just one girl, a little kid about Bliss's age, but there was something wrong with her. She wouldn't talk to me properly, and when I just patted her on the shoulder, she screamed, jerking away from me. It takes Sharon a while to make friends, Lily, said Stevie. She'll get used to you. It'll be nice for her to have you around, just like a big sister. I didn't want to get used to her, or her used to me. I didn't want her for my sister. I had two of my own. I couldn't stand to stay in this shabby living room with the cartoon channel blaring. I went and sat in my own room. It wasn't much more than a cupboard, but at least I didn't have to share with any of the boys. I lay down on the bed with its horrible Spider-Man duvet and tried to make a plan. I'd watched all the road names from the baby lady house to here, trying to memorise them, but we'd gone round the one-way system and I'd got muddled. Still, I could try to make a stab at finding my way back to Baxter and Pixie, and somehow rescue them. Then we'd have to go to the hospital for Bliss. She wouldn't be able to walk yet. Maybe we could go to the park and find Pixie's buggy. Then the four of us could go to the police station, tell them Mum never deliberately left us, and that someone else gave her the credit card. It wasn't Mum's fault. She hadn't done anything wrong. We'd walk out of the station hand in hand, all five of us, and then we'd go back to our flat and we'd have a celebration meal. We'd lie on the sofa, Mum in the middle of us, and I'd hold them all tight and never let them go. I never wanted to be Lily alone ever again. I stayed there in the tiny room, hanging onto the sides of the bed as if it was a raft. Stevie put her head around the door and suggested I join the other kids, but I shook my head and she didn't make me. Then one of the boys came barging in, plonking himself down on the end of the bed. I'm Ian, he said, bouncing. Do you mind? Don't sit on my bed. Ooh, shirty gerty. It's not your bed, it's actually my bed. I'm having to share with Duncan because you're here. Well, I'm not here long, so you'll get your poxy bed back, don't worry. What are you here for then? What you done? I haven't done anything. Oh yeah, come on then. What did you do? Me and my brother Duncan, we kept setting light to the dustbins in our flats. It was wicked. Then one time we sprinkled a little too much petrol and kapow! Nina, Nina, Nina! Four fire engines and all those cops running around. Better than fireworks night it was. He rubbed his hands together as if he was warming them at his stupid fire. Pathetic, I said. Pathetic and pointless. No, it wasn't, mate. It was awesome. If you didn't do nothing, you must be here because of your mum or dad. I haven't even got a dad. Stepdad, then. Did yours beat you up? I'd beat him up if he laid a finger on me. What about your mum then? What did she do? Wash her hands of you? No, she didn't, I said, sitting up. Clear off. Get out of my room. Okay, okay. I just came to tell you supper's nearly ready. I don't want any. It's pizza. I don't care what it is. You're mad, you. Can I have yours then? Be my guest. Stevie made me come down to supper, and she told me I had to eat my own pizza, but she couldn't make me. I am going to have to feed you like Sharon, she said, prodding my mouth with a forkful, joking around. I heaved, so she stopped that trick pretty sharpish and let me go. The kids played a stupid indoor football game up and down the stairs after supper. Ian threw the ball at me, wanting me to join in, but I sloped off by myself and sat slumped against the front door. I wasn't sure if it was locked. I sat there waiting for my chance. Hey, Lily, said Stevie, 
walking down the hall and hovering beside me. Hope you're not planning to do a runner. I need to go to see Bliss. She'll be so scared in hospital, all by herself. Please let me go and see her, I begged. I can't let you go off by yourself, love, and I can't take you. Not when I've got all the other kids to look after. It'll be after visiting hours at the hospital anyway, so they wouldn't let you see her. I put my head on my knees. Look, tell you what, why don't we phone up? I went into her office and she phoned the hospital. It took a long time to get through to the right ward and then they wouldn't let me speak to Bliss. But a nurse said she was doing well and was tucked up fast asleep now. There, happier now, said Stevie. Well, I don't know that's right. The nurse could just have been saying that, I said. And I'm still dead worried about my other sister, Pixie, and Baxter too, at this Mrs. Robinson's. Oh, I know her. She's a lovely lady, wonderful with little kiddies. Yes, but Baxter's not little. He'll absolutely hate being treated like a baby. Can we phone them up too, Stevie, please, just to say good night and show them I haven't forgotten them? Mrs. Robinson will be in the middle of getting them all bathed and ready for bed right now. Maybe we'll phone later. But they'll be in bed then, and she'll say they're fast asleep, I said. I was in tears now. Please, Stevie, please, please, please. So she phoned Mrs. Robinson for me. Mr. Mrs. Mr. Robinson answered, said his wife was bathing the little ones. After a lot of begging, he shouted out for Baxter, put him on the phone. Hello, Baxter. Who's this? Lily, you silly. Hey, that rhymes. Oh, Baxter, are you all right? Of course I am. Uncle Ted and me are watching football on the telly. Who? You haven't got an Uncle Ted. He's just a temporary foster parent. You'll be home with me as soon as I can fix it, okay? What about Pixie? How's she doing? She's in the bath with them babies, said Baxter. She can't come. She's all wet. Well, will you tell her I called and that I love her and we'll all be together soon, I promise. Okay, okay. Got to go now. They just scored a goal and I missed it. Oh, Baxter, look, I love you too. Yeah, yeah, he paused. Lily, do you think Bliss is all right? Yes, I phoned the hospital and they said she was fine. Honest? Yes, honestly. Good, well, bye, Lily. There, said Stevie, who'd been listening. He sounded perfectly fine, sweetheart, didn't he? He sounded a little too fine. I was astonished he was already calling a complete stranger uncle and annoyed he wasn't sticking close to Pixie. I needed to be with them, with Bliss, with Mum. I was trying not to think about Mum because it was too terrifying. I saw her locked in a cell, screaming with policemen shouting at her, slapping her around, making her confess. Couldn't they see she wasn't a bad mum? She loved us to bits. She always had. She was just so young and pretty. She needed to go out sometimes. She hadn't meant to leave us all alone. She thought she'd fixed it with Mikey. She was simply leaving us with her dad like millions of other mums. It was my fault. I didn't explain things to Mikey when he phoned. It was my fault mum met Gordon in the first place. I had tried to stop mum using the dodgy credit card, but that hadn't been all her fault. She hadn't stolen it. She'd been given it by that friend. I'd tried to tell the nice young policeman with the brown eyes, but he hadn't written it all down in his notebook. Stevie, can I make another phone call? What? Oh, come on, Lily. You're taking the mick now. I need to phone the police. I have to explain about mum. Better still, I need to go down there, make a proper statement. Show them my mum's the best mum ever, and this is all a stupid, awful mistake. I just have to tell them. I was shouting now, pounding Stevie with my fists. Hey, hey. She grabbed my hands. Calm down now. You're getting in a silly state for nothing. You can't go barging into the police station, telling them what's what, not at this stage. I'm sure you'll have your chance later. Your social worker will be having a long chat at some point. I need to sort it out now, I sobbed. No, now you need to eat properly and catch up on sleep. Look at your little white face and those dark panda rings under your eyes. You need to stop worrying so. You're safe and Bliss is fine in hospital and the other two sound perfectly happy. So you can take it easy now, sweetheart. You don't have to try to look after them anymore. You need looking after now. Stevie was kind, but she didn't have a clue. I didn't have any of my own stuff with me. She gave me a toothbrush and a silly flannel. It was a tiny scrunched up square until she put it in water and it grew. Stevie expected me to be enchanted as if I was Pixie's age. I didn't have any night clothes, so I had to go to bed in someone's Batman pyjamas. Stupid superheroes fought around me all night while I lay awake, sending frantic thought messages to Bliss and Baxter and Pixie. I got up very early, wondering if I could creep out now before anyone was around. But Stevie had taken my t-shirt and jeans. She'd even taken my trainers. I went stomping downstairs in my embarrassing boy pyjamas. I found her in the kitchen with one of her sidekicks, both of them dressed in t-shirts and tracky bottoms. Hi, sweetie, said Stevie. Sleep okay? No. And someone's stolen all my stuff. Your utterly filthy jeans and t-shirt stuff, said Stevie, pointing to a whole load of clothes airing on a huge rack. And did they steal your trainers too? She pointed to my trainers, 
toe to toe on a sheet of newspaper, scrubbed free of mud and whitened so they looked brand new. Oh, I said. I struggled. Uh, uh, thank you. I didn't wait to be great, want to be grateful to her. I wanted her to be horrible, and then I could blame her for everything, even though I knew this was ridiculous. If you're going to be here a little while, we'll have to get you clothes from home, or sort you out with some new stuff, said Stevie. I'm afraid we haven't got any girl girls' skirts for school, so you'll have to go in your jeans today. I bet all of the other kids will envy you like crazy. What? I stared at her. I'm not going to school. It seemed a totally ludicrous idea, but Stevie stood firm. You go to Oakleaf Primary, don't you? It's not too far away. Most of our boys go to Wilton Road, but we can drop you off afterwards. Stevie, you're mad, I said rudely. My mum might have been sent straight to prison. My sister's seriously ill in hospital. My brother and baby sister are stuck with a complete stranger. And you tell me I've got to go to school, like it's an ordinary day. I'm not mad, sweetie. I know just how you feel, but I think it would be best to do something ordinary, like going to school. You don't have a clue how I feel. Stop calling me sweetie. It sounds stupid. I bet you're just saying it because you've forgotten my name. You're Lily. And you're quite unforgettable, said Stevie. I thought if I argued long enough, she'd give in or lose her temper. And then we could have a standing fight. But she just kept telling me calmly I was going to school and that was that. It was weird having a proper breakfast sitting down at a long table with all the unruly boys and surly little Sharon. I ate a few cornflakes and half a slice of toast and sipped at a cup of tea. I felt a bit sick in the minivan, being driven off to school with all the boys. When we got to Oak Cliff, Stevie insisted on coming right into the playground with me, to the head teacher's office. I can't stick Mrs. Symes, our head. She's never thought much of me either. Oh dear, what have you been up to now, Lily Green? She said when she saw me standing beside Stevie. She hasn't done anything, Mrs. Symes. I, I just need to have a little chat with you. Lily, perhaps you could wait outside, love, said Stevie. I put my head against the door and tried to listen, of course, but Stevie kept her voice down. Mrs. Symes was easier to hear because she's got one of those booming voices that reach right to the back of the school hall. I heard that mother and problem family and doesn't surprise me in the least. I hated her. I hated her. I hated her. The bell went off for morning school, clanging right through my head. I made a bolt down the hall, but Mrs. Symes opened her door and spotted me. Lily Green, where do you think you're going? To my classroom, Mrs. Symes, because the bell went, I said. Oh, well, walk, don't run, said Mrs. Symes. Bye, Lily, I'll come and meet you this afternoon, Stevie called. She was acting like my jailer, determined to stop me going off to see the kids. I stomped down the corridor, children staring at my jeans and starry t-shirt. What are you wearing them for, someone asked. Because I want to, that's why, I said. It seemed so strange going into my own classroom. It felt as if I'd been away for years. The class fell silent at the sight of me. Mr. Abbott stood up. His Adam's apple wobbled as he swallowed. Hello, Lily, he said softly. I stared at him, straight in the eyes. I saw them flicker. It was enough. He was the one who betrayed us. I stalked straight past him to my desk and sat down. Mr. Abbott watched me, but didn't make me speak to him. He told everyone to get out their books for a maths lesson. I got out my book too, but I didn't attempt any of the sums. I drew in the margin, four small stick people and one bigger one. Then it was literacy, and we had to do work on The Secret Garden. This was a book I loved, although most of our class hated it because it was written in a hard way, especially the Yorkshire bits. Mr. Abbott kept asking questions, glancing at me now and then, because he knew I'd have an answer, but I didn't put my hand up once. The bell rang for playtime, and everyone started shoving their books away. All right, off you go. Have a good run around and wake yourselves up, he paused. Lily, could I have a word? The other kids nudged each other, eyes gleaming, because it looked as if I was for it. I strolled to the front of the class, humming, acting like I couldn't care less. Just a minute, Lily, said Mr. Abbott, waiting until the last child was out of the room, and then he turned to me. How are you? I stared at him. How do you think I am? I hissed. I didn't care that he was my teacher, and I might get into trouble for talking like that. He was my favourite teacher in all the world, and that made it worse. What happened, Lily? Tell me. We've been taken into care, me and my brother and sisters, and my mum might go to prison. It's all your fault, I said. Mr. Abbott's head jerked as if I'd slapped him. You came around again, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was very worried about you, and then I saw your letter, which said we were all going on holiday. Yes, but did you really expect me to believe that? Come on, Lily, I was pretty sure you children were on your own. I had to tell someone. Anything could have happened to you. Where did you go? How did you manage? I've been worried sick about you. 
If you hadn't come around poking your nose in, we'd have been fine, absolutely fine. We had to run away after you came round. We went to the park. My sister Bliss got hurt. She's in hospital now, and I can't bear her being there all alone without us. Mum came back. I, I knew she would, but now the police have got her and I'm stuck in this children's home. It's awful, awful, awful. I was sobbing, unable to stop. Oh, Lily, don't cry. I feel so dreadful. I want to give you a great big hug, but teachers aren't allowed to do that. I want to give you a great big punch, but children aren't allowed to do that, I cried. I want to punch me too for upsetting you. I wish I hadn't interfered, but I felt it was my duty. That sounds so pompous. I I'm so sorry. How is Bliss? Is she badly hurt? She fell out of a tree and hurt her head, and I think her leg's all broken. I'm so worried about her. Well, tell you what. I'll talk to whoever runs this children's home, see if I can get permission to take you to the hospital to visit her. And my other sister and brother? They've been fostered. Will you take me to see them too? Yes, of course I will. If they'll let me, Lily, I'm so, so sorry. He looked as if he really meant it. His eyes were watery, almost as if he was going to cry. He was acting, really, like he cared for me. I know you didn't mean it to work out like this, Mr. Rabbit, I said, and I was ever so pleased you brought me the angel postcards. I've still got them safe. Maybe I can take you to see the real paintings one day. I pretended we did that, I said shyly. I really, really wanted to see those paintings. You're such a special girl, Lily. I stiffened. You mean like special needs? No, I mean you're a girl with special, remarkable qualities. No, I'm not. I'm not clever. I'm rubbish at maths and that, and, I, and I'm from a problem family. Who said that? Mrs. Symes. What? To you? No, to this care worker, Stevie, but I heard it. Oh dear, well, I think Mrs. Symes is mistaken, though don't quote me on that. You seem a lovely family, you and your sisters and brother. You were all getting along splendidly when I came round to your house. You're so good with the children, Lily. You're going to be a lovely mother one day. My mum's a lovely mother, Mr. Abbott. He nodded, but he didn't look convinced. I was lying that night, saying she'd gone to the shops. Yes, but I understand why you were telling fibs. She did go off, but I swear she didn't mean us to be stuck on our own, Mr. Abbott. What will happen to my mum? Mr. Abbott hesitated. I'm not sure, Lily. Will she go to prison? I don't really know. I wouldn't think so. So will we be able to go back to our flat, all of us together? I hope so. I'm going to try hard to make that happen. Mr. Abbott, I really miss my mum. I know you do. I'm sure you'll be able to see her soon. Lily, he said, and he gently patted my shoulder. He was right. I was having spaghetti for tea with all the boys and Sharon when there was a ring on the doorbell. Stevie went to see who it was and came back smiling. Someone for you, Lily, she said. I went flying to the door and there was Mum, looking wonderful in her new silky dress, her hair loose and lovely on her shoulders, honey brown all over. Hello, gorgeous, she said, holding out her arms. I flung myself at her. Hey, gently, I'm wearing my daft heels. You'll have me over, <laughs> you silly sausage. Pleased to see your old Mum, eh? Oh, Mum, have you come to take me home? Well, not just yet. I've packed you up a little carrier of your clothes here, your school uniform and your jacket and that. What were you doing in it? it looked like you were all mud wrestling. Duncan and Ian came out into the hall and stared at us. Is that your mum? Duncan said. You see, I told you she'd come, I said. She's pretty, said Ian. Yeah, that's me, very pretty. And I must say you're a handsome little chap, said mum, tossing her hair and smiling at him, even though Ian was seven and had knock knees and a runny nose. Do you think I'm handsome too? Duncan said. Yes, you're positively gorgeous. Lily, any chance you and me could go off for a little stroll? Have a proper chat? No chance, I'm afraid, said Stevie, coming into the hall too. But you could go up to Lily's room if you like. I'll make sure the other kids leave you in peace. And then you and I must have a little chat too, Miss Green. I'm sure you know you're supposed to have a proper supervised visit at an arranged time. Still, I know how much this means to both of you, so I'll turn a blind eye this time. Oh, thank you ever so much, said Mum, with exaggerated politeness. She raised her eyebrows at me as we went upstairs. My God, I've got to get permission to jump through all sorts of hoops just to see my own daughter. One old bossy boots. And what does she look like? Stevie's okay, Mum. Stevie, Mum snorted. She sniffed at my room too. It's like a little rabbit hutch. Where did they get that awful duvet from? A pound shop? Honestly, they think this rubbish place is better than your own home. Your own room at home. I didn't even have my own room at home. I didn't even have a proper bed. I shared a mattress with the twins, but I wasn't going to point this out. I sat down on Spider-Man and Mum sat down beside me, her arm round me. Don't you worry, pet. I'll get you out of here. You trust your old mum. We'll be back home quick as a wink. With Bliss and Baxter and Pixie? Of course, all of us. Oh, mum, I'm so worried about Bliss. She'll be so scared all by herself in hospital. 
She's fine, lovey, truly, sitting up and playing, though obviously she can't move about much because of her leg. This lady was helping her make a new head for Headless, stuffing an old sock. It looked a bit of a fright, but Bliss seemed happy enough. And look, she made you this. Mum fumbled in her bag, brought out a Get Well card, carefully coloured in, with a big lily printed at the top in purple crayon and a wobbly row of kisses. But I'm not the one who needs to get well. It's Bliss. Yeah, I know, she got the wrong end of the stick, bless her, but I don't like to point it out. She said to tell you she's sorry she fell out of the tree. Oh, poor Bliss. I so want to see her. Mr Abbott said he might take me to see her. That interfering old git? I'll take you. We'll fix it up with bossy boots with a bad haircut. Maybe I'll get Simon to run us to the hospital. You have to wait ages for the bus. Simon? That policeman with the fair hair, you know, he came to the hospital yesterday. You have to have a police escort. No, you noodle. He'll take me as a friend. He was so sweet to me yesterday. I cried all over him. He was lovely about it. So they've let you go. Well, they've charged me on two counts. Simon reckons I won't be able to talk myself out of the credit card fraud, especially as I've got previous. But it was only a few hundred after all. If I'm lucky, the magistrates will just give me community service, probably 80 hours. So that's a bit of a laugh. Though God help me if I have to, to wear them orange overalls. It's going to be a bit of a long haul struggle with a child neglect charge. All these know-it-alls will be making reports and filling up their registers and acting like bleeding school teachers. When it was a simple mistake. Mikey was coming. It was all sorted. Well, sort of. I'll tell them it was all my fault, Mum, I said. No, it wasn't your fault, darling. You've been wonderful by all accounts. A proper little mother to the kids. No, I wasn't. I couldn't look after them properly. Bliss fell out of the tree. That was my fault. I wasn't watching them. <laughs> For heaven's sake, you can't keep your eye on kids all the time. She's doing fine. She'll have a little scar on her forehead, but she can always grow a fringe. And her leg's setting nicely. She'll be out of hospital in no time. They won't let her home with me just yet, but there's talk of her going to that foster home with Baxter and my little pixie, so they can all be together. They wouldn't let me stay there. Yes, but you're a grown-up girl, babe. You have to be brave and hang out here on your on your own, yo, just, just for a little while, and then we'll all be back together. You really promise? Well, Simon says, that sounds funny, doesn't it? Like like that party game. Anyway, Simon says it's a 99% certainty. And you can't get better than that, can you? I'd sooner it was 100%. This Simon, you're not getting off with him, are you? Don't be so daft. Uh, I imagine having a copper for a boyfriend. Still, he is quite sweet. And I think he said something about his marriage breaking up. He earns a good wage and he'd be a very good influence on Baxter. <laughs> Your face, Lily, I'm just kidding. He was just helping me out because he felt sorry for me. Now I've got to struggle around with another bag of clothes for Baxter and Pixie, so I'd better get a move on or it'll be their bedtime. I need to see my little man. I'm a baby. Oh, Lily, I miss you kids so much. I'm never, ever going to leave you again. Not even for a night. Now give us a kiss goodbye. There's a good girl. I'll come back as soon as I can, I promise. I stayed in my room after Mum went. I tried to stop myself crying by playing my Lily Alone game, but it was pointless. I didn't want to live all alone in my big white dream house anymore. I tore all the used pages out of my drawing book. Then I started on a new drawing of our living room at home. I drew mum on the sofa with me next to her, Pixie on my lap. Baxter was curled up next to mum and Bliss was cuddled up to me. Her poorly leg propped up. We're all going to be together very, very soon. I wrote underneath. And that is the end of Lily Alone by Jacqueline Wilson. Really hope you enjoyed that story, guys. I'll be back soon with lots more stories and videos coming on my channel. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.